cellular wireless networks. About we want to cover principles of cellular networks. Look at the organization of um, cellular networks. So at least we can have a pretty good idea of how they structured and um, leveled up in terms of its uh, design. Uh, we also want to look at um, shapes. I also want to look at shapes and the geometries involved in, in, uh, in designing cellular networks. as a way of uh, handling various uh, uh, cellular devices or mobile devices within a given geographical uh, location. And we also want to look at um, frequencies and how they play a key role in its uh, implementation within cellular networks, especially when it comes to handling of uh, handling management of frequencies. So we'll look at frequency reuse, the characterizations and the various patterns that goes with it. And then we'll also look at um, Uh, capacity increments, especially when in, in the areas of trying to uh, accommodate for uh, high traffic needs within a given location, what are some of the capacity needs that you need to put in place? So we'll look at some of those things. Um, in addition to uh, splitting of cells as a way to basically improve and uh, and, uh, and adapt to capacity needs within a given uh, cellular network service. And we'll look at the operations of cellular systems. So basically those are some of the key things we're gonna be looking at in the first overview. The others uh, also revolves around uh, how you make a, a call within a given um, uh, a given typical cellular networks um, implementation, how calls are established and terminated. So we'll look at typical calls within single uh, mobile telecom uh, telecommunication switching offices and how they function. Uh, and then we'll also look at mobile radio propagation effects, which relates to issues that re that has got to do with the uh, the way the radio frequencies or radio waves propagate to address uh, uh, reception needs, you know, within cellular networks. We'll look at some of the, the design factors and error compensation mechanisms. So at least. Uh, Issues like uh, fading, uh, interferences, uh, and all kinds of other issues uh, can be well addressed within cellular networks. Also, look at frequency diversity and then first generation, um, and obviously, subsequent generation uh, cellular networks from first generation to second and, and current um, technologies that are addressing cellular networks. We also look at CDMAs as another form of uh, cellular network design or implementation and some of the benefit that comes with it and it's challenged as well. So let's try to get um, a brief intro 
about uh, cellular networks. So in general, the key essence of a cellular network is to use uh, multiple low power transmitters to address transmission needs over a wireless or over a, a radio frequency wave or a radio wave, so to speak. So principles of cellular networks. Uh, cellular radio techniques were developed um, to increase, in a way to increase uh, capacity for existing mobile radio telephone services. They were also designed to support shorter range transmissions, as well as low power transmitters and receivers, or what you term transceivers. Uh, at the time of cellular networks, existing mobile radio telephone services supported high power transceivers, and they were usually using about 25 channels for transmission, and they cover wider radius, uh, like 80 kilometer. Uh, radius coverage, uh, but one of the downside about that was that they were using too much power, they were so bulky in design, like some of these that you see up here. And they had to basically uh, come up with existing, you know, infrastructure. Designs like these were the norms of uh, what you would term first generation cellular networks. Uh, they had only 25 channels to work with, but then most of its implementation, and then they were designed to cover a wider range of uh, of coverage. Uh, but with time, it wasn't realistic anymore. It wasn't practical. Uh, I mean, if you think about the bulkiness of these devices, trying to carry them around, it didn't really quite make a <laughs> make it much uh, convenient to address these mobility needs. So the design had to improve, you know, uh, various technologies and implementation has to be thought of and, and, and looked at uh, to reshape the dynamics of uh, of such a, such existing mobile radio telephone services, organization of our cell network comes into play, where multiple low power transmitters, uh, usually within uh, uh, hundred watts or less uh, capacity, uh, where 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 designed were implemented or basically. Uh, uh, started becoming the mainstream divided device implementation to be used for cellular transmissions. Um, and it, within that same specs, uh, areas needed to, needed to be divided into various units or various segments called cells. With each of these uh, segmentations or cells, um, having their own antennas uh, and also occupied or were assigned a range of frequencies. Uh, some of these segmentation or cells, in technical term, uh, uh, were designed to also serve what you call a base unit or a base station. And a base station would consist of a transmitter a receiver and a control unit to be able to manage a given cell unit or segmentation unit in terms of geographical design or allocation to be able to address the uh, the low power uh, transmitters that needed to be incorporated into the uh, current trends of our of, uh, cellular networks designs and its organization. Um, cells that were 
adjacent to uh, existing uh, cells uh, had to use different frequencies in order to avoid uh, issues that relates to uh, crosstalks, uh, fading, and interferences from uh, uh, other cells that were adjacent to, you know, another, another cell. So in terms of organization, there were various key uh, structures that needed to put in place to make sure that if we're gonna come up with a, 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 a network um, that was gonna have a low power transmitter, a number of key things needed to be uh, cut off or implemented or put, it, put together to make sure um various challenges that might come up can easily be addressed or can easily be ma managed properly uh to help uh achieve the whole purpose of uh of what a cellular network uh was uh designed for or was uh implemented for Now, when it comes to the cell divisions, uh, there's usually a pattern in which they, uh, they are designed, or they call them shapes in which they are designed. So cells take on shapes, and there are generally two main types of uh, shapes. Uh, only one is much more widely used these days, but the two main uh, uh, shapes or division of cells that were uh, that came up with an implementation uh, was one of them happens to be a square shape where you'd have uh, each side of a given geographical demarcation having the exact same uh, dimension so they were even across uh, to be able to provide a more or less uh, a service, a cellular service within that given square geographical um, uh, demarcation. So the square shape was one of them and the other one which happens to be the most widely used now is the hexagon shape. Now we'll get to why the hexagon is widely used today as more of an efficient uh, cell shape design within cellular networks. So when it comes to the, um, the various shapes for, uh, for a cell, uh, I mentioned the square pattern and then the hexagon pattern, pattern or shapes in terms of its uh, design. Uh, the square pattern, uh, to illustrate it better in terms of how it's designed and structured and actually, you know, uh, design and implement it, we use a big square. So keep in mind, square has got what all sides equal, right? Great. So here, let's say this were, to, were supposed to be the uh, geographical boundary has been uh, allocated for cellular uh, transmission service or cellular network services. And an engineer was uh, assigned to go and survey in terms of uh, and put together a proposal on how to uh, go about with an implementation of cell patterns for that particular cellular service uh, uh, service provision and in this case so within this setup you would have uh, nine cells within this big cell big square uh, geographical boundary we have cell one cell two cell three four five six seven eight nine we have nine cells with a big given cell or geographical cell boundary. 
okay so to identify because distances plays a key role in terms of how cells are going to be positioned within that given geographical uh, location and according to the uh, design of a square pattern for uh, what cellular network in terms of shapes and its designs uh, to identify where to position cells they will give them names so let's look at some of the names uh, cells that are next to each other in this case that are right across from each other are usually termed opposite cells so in this case the middle cell over here has an opposite, an opposite cell of this cell, an opposite cell of this cell, an opposite cell of this cell in relation to this, and right over here in relation to this. Cells that share the same, so you okay, can put it that way. In that sense, opposite cells would be cells that share the same size with another cell. So if you if were to uh, use this middle cell as your point of reference, then its opposite cells will be this guys, that guy, that guy, that guy, because they share the same sides, right? But cells that share vectors with other cells are termed adjacent cells. So in this case, these are the vectors which are the a vector is where two lines meet, two lines with shape meet. That's a vector. So within a square pattern, you would have four vectors. One, two, three, four. So the point at which a cell uh, shares a vector with another cell is termed the adjacent cell. So this, if you were to use this source of point of reference, its adjacent cell will be this cell over here because they share the same vector. Okay? And in this, with the same relation with this and this, this will be the adjacent cell in relation to this. And it will be the adjacent cell for this guy as well and for this guy. Okay, so let, let's, let's get that clear. Adjacent cells share vectors while opposite cells share sites. So within this geographical boundary, if the cells were supposed to be implemented, in this sense, we have nine cells. Uh, you would have one, two, three, four adjacent cells and also one, two, three, four opposite cells. Now, to determine the distance where uh, cells need to be placed, either side by side or vectors wise, uh, or which in other sense, adjacent wise, um, how do you go about with the calculation? How do you, how do you determine where they can be, where to place it so you can get the optimal transmission service for your cellular network services that you want to? Uh, provide for that given geographical boundary. Okay, so usually we say the center of a square pattern of a square of a square, the distance from the middle of the square to any of its side is usually termed the radius. Okay, radius happens to be uh, the distance between the center of a square center of a square to any of its sides. So this will be the radius of the square, radius of the square, radius of the square. If you were to extend it, you were to extend the radius to another cell that's usually opposite, you'd get what you call the diameter. Right? Because two radius forms one diameter, right? So opposite cells share a diameter. So that's how you would know where to place uh, a given base unit when it, when it comes to a, a opposite cell implementation. You would have to just multiply the radius of that first given cell by two. 
to get where you're going to place your opposite base station unit within a straight line uh, direction. But when it comes to the adjacent, it's usually the diameter, which is obviously two times the radius of one cell, multiplied by the square root of two. That will give you the distance for, ad for adjacent cells implementation. So in other words, if you wanted to place, if you decide to place an adjacent cell over here, the question is how far should the base station at the middle of this cell be from its adjacent cell over here, from this cell over here. And the formula says you use the square root of two times the radius times two, or the diameter of that, uh, of that given square pattern. Okay, so that should clarify, you know, uh, how the, uh, the distances are measured or cell uh, placement, cell implementation, or base station units uh, installations within a given square pattern uh, shape. Okay. Now, when it comes to the other uh, shape, which happens to be the hexagon pattern, the most popularly, the most popular, and most widely used. Uh, uh, a shape of most cellular networks is the hexagon pattern. Now, I'll get to why it, it's actually most popular. Uh, no, it, it's, it's not so much about the popularity, it's far more about uh, the efficiency in terms of coverage needs that a, uh, a hexagon shape offers. That makes it much more. Uh, uh, popular in, in, in adapt, the adaptation for most cellular network implementation. So usually hexagon patterns would provide equidistant antennas, and uh, the, the the radius of uh, the hexagon is usually the distance from the middle of the hexagon to any of its vectors not the sides, keep that in mind, but the vectors would illustrate or would de define the radius. So in this right over here, you notice that the radius is actually the distance from the middle to a vector. From here to a vector will be termed the radius. And your your D or your rate, your di diameter, which will indicate where to place a given, uh, uh, should I say, adjacent cell, would probably be uh, uh, would probably be the uh, at a well-defined distance from the center. Of one, of one hexagon cell to another that shares the same side. So in this case, if this was the cell of, of point of reference, its adjacent cell would be the one that it shares the same side with, which, which, a, bit, which, which is a bit of uh, an opposite to what a square pattern would have for its um, uh, opposite and adjacent cell. Okay, and in this case, the diameter here is actually the uh, the distance between the middle of one cell and that cell that it shares the same side with. That distance is what you term your D or your diameter, and usually. Uh, The initial calculations for that is based on the radius times the square root of three. So if you pick one radius of a given hexagon cell and you multiply by you multiply that by the square root of three, not a cube root, but the square root of three, then you'd have more or less your uh uh 
uh, what I would say is your adjacent cell in a way, you know, so, so to speak. That would be your adjacent cell distance. Okay. So within a hexagon panel, you have a, you'd have a provision for a distance in the center, uh, with radius defined as the radius of uh, the circumcircle, which happens to be the distance from the center of a given uh, hexagon pan to a vector of equal length uh, with relation to the sides. And a distance d, which you which you term your maybe your radius or your diameter, will be between centers of cells which share a radio, which have a, a radius of uh, of r, and multiply by the the uh, the square root of three. So that would give you your 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 diameter, I guess. So the diameter of the hexagon pattern shape implementation for adjacent cells would be the, the radius itself of that particular cell for a given cell multiplied by the square root of 3. And the square root of 3 is 1.732 and you multiply by the radius of that hexagon cell. Okay? Now, not only um, does um, hexagon shape offer precision? Uh, in terms of topography limitations, they offer good benefits. Uh, they also offer local signal propagation conditions, and location of antennas are much more efficient in, in its implementation. Okay, so you could probably say these. Uh, some of the key benefits that one could get from using a, a hexagon pattern shape for cellular network implementation. They offer uh, topographical limit, they cover or they address topographical limitations. Uh, okay, so let me go about, let me go, maybe, maybe, maybe this is where I should point out why the hexagon is much more uh adapted for most of the networks uh so as, as is well pointed over here not always precise hexagons have got the uh the shapes that you need to or the right shape that you need to do a given coverage but for the most part within given topographical uh areas uh the limitations of covering uh specific areas can be well addressed by the hexagon shape much, much better than a square pattern shape would. Okay? Now, it's not, like, like, like it's mentioned away, it's not all that accurate, uh, especially when you have a given geographical, geographical location and you have dead spots that comes up because of the shape of how a hexagon looks like. Then you have limitations within the topography of a given uh, geographical location that you're trying to provision uh, a cellular network for. But if it were to be uh, for to be of a shape that wasn't regular, or in other words, irregular, then you would notice that the hexagon cells would actually create a better coverage if assuming that the geographical coverage wasn't as squared or regular as you as as as, uh, um, as you see over here where it's straight edge straight, straight edge then you're gonna have that spot that could create a lot of limitations but if the demarcation is of no irreg of no regular shape or it's irregular, which means either not oval shape, round shape, curving it has a bit of curves in them, then you're bound to accomplish uh, good coverage uh, using a hexagon uh, uh, pattern.